Welcome to Limitless, the blind beginnings podcast where seeing things differently inspires limitless possibilities. This podcast is being brought to you by Blind Beginnings, an organization based in Vancouver, Canada, that supports children and youth who are blind or partially sighted, along with their families. Limitless was created in order to inform, educate, entertain, and share stories from within the blind and partially sighted community, in order to show the world that the opportunities for those who are blind or partially sighted are truly limitless. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to your host, the executive director and founder of Blind Beginnings, Sean Marsley. Welcome back to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast. I'm your host, Sean Marsley. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. Today, we're talking about audio description, and I'm so excited to have guests from Descriptive Video Works, which is a company that produces and creates audio description. Melissa Hope and Reese Lloyd, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Thank Sean. you, Sean. Yeah, thanks for being here. Can you describe for our listeners what audio description is maybe before we kind of dive deep into this topic? Yeah, we get this this question a lot and uh, it, you need you need the elevator pitch when you work in audio description um, or described video as we technically call it in Canada, uh, but it is audio description in the US and so that ends up being used most of the time. See, I already learned something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when it's when it's um, audio description to Netflix and to Disney Plus, then it means that described video actually doesn't get used very often as a phrase, uh, mm -hmm. even within the industry, I don't think. But uh, I like to say that audio description is a translation. It is translating visual images into spoken words to make um, visual mediums accessible to people who are blind and low vision or who are for other reasons, not watching or not absorbing information from a screen. And I like that for, I like the emphasis on translation because I think it's important to note that this is a, a profession that requires that kind of seriousness. And sometimes people think of, if you just talk about how it's like closed captioning for the blind, I think it's confusing to people who then think that it's somehow something that's on the screen instead of spoken words, or they get confused and stop thinking about people who are blind and start thinking about people who are deaf and just get it all muddled in their heads. And so I think that the the emphasis on translation and emphasis on accessibility to people who aren't you know seeing a screen are the two components that really help most people grasp it mm -hmm. until they hear it and then they really get it i think that a lot of the time people just need to hear it and then they're like oh that okay that makes sense yeah that's a really good point because i i feel like closed captioning you're you're literally just typing the words that people are saying but with described video you're creating what you're saying right like you're interpreting you're watching you're interpreting you're creating the words that are then spoken so there's a lot more to it yeah and you know can't be done as by computers <laughs> <laughs> yes i would agree um can you both explain your roles with descriptive video works and how the heck did you get into this field because i feel like it's a little special and unique reese why don't you go first sure so I, i'm the studio head for descriptive video works which which means that i i get all the glory and do none of the work and uh <laughs> No. So not true. <laughs> or, or I get the blame. Um, no. Uh, uh, so uh, my job is really to sort of guide and grow the business uh, of descriptive video works to sort of shepherd the strategy, uh, you know, while ensuring that we put the the best people in place to sort of guide the the day to day operations and production. Um, and how did I get into this work? Um, I've been working in film post production for. 25 years, excuse me, uh, quite, quite some time. And uh, I, um, and, and it, what really drew me into the film industry in the first place really was uh, uh, that I, I wanted to work in a field where you could be building and creating connections between people. But that was, uh, that if you could spend your work life doing that, there's kind of nothing better than that. And so, um, early in my career, that was working sort of as an, a film editor and then in distribution of film and TV. And then 
uh, <laughs> I had a, a little bit of a tenuous grasp on that sense of connection when I worked in visual effects because it's really just about crushing pixels. But um, but uh, when the opportunity came to join Descriptive Video Works in 2019, I it, I jumped at it because it really was uh, it spoke to that sort of core belief and and feeling that I had because really we're we're in the process of like building connection, building bridges of of interpretation or translation or understanding of the visual content for people who otherwise would not get that. And so that's I mean that's how I got into it. And then I, I didn't have a, I didn't have a background in accessibility prior to that. I, I had dealt with accessibility versions of things in distribution, but, uh, but hadn't worked directly in it and quickly found that this is the, honestly, like, no joke, this is the best job I've ever had. And I can't think of anything better than this. Melissa, what about you? What's your role and how did you get here? Yeah. Um, so if, if Reese is big picture, then I am tiny details and lose track of the big picture uh, a lot of the time because of that. Um, my job is client services manager and project manager. So I am working with a team to do quotes for customers uh, and potential clients and to uh, get the projects from the client to the studio or for, to the writer, to the studio, and back to the client. And so it's a lot of the day-to-day -day moving uh, bits of video and bits of audio files around. And uh, how I got into it, um, I have this memory of a PSA that I think most Canadians will have seen uh, that advertised about audio description way back in the day. And it was like this very blurry video where you could hear sort of tropical sounds and it sounded like a rainforest. And then the picture clarifies and it shows that it's a couple in their kitchen frying bacon and they do have a parrot in the room. And it's like, you know, audio description bridges that gap was basically the theme. And so I was kind of this, had this vague awareness of audio description since that day or since that ad was shown on a regular basis. And then uh, I, I, but didn't think much more of it. And then I had a localized retinal tear a couple of years ago. And the treatment for that is you uh, lay on your side for like five days with your eyes closed. And <laughs> not many of my hobbies are very conducive to laying on my side for five days with my eyes closed. My cat loved it, but I wasn't so thrilled. And uh, I discovered, rediscovered audio description or kind of discovered it for the first time and learned what that ad really meant and fell in love with it as an art form. And so when I was considering a career move uh, from my previous job, I started looking at what audio description jobs were available and was lucky enough to be hired first part-time as a part-time project manager for Descriptive Video Works and have been growing that job ever since. <laughs> oh, it's wow. not part-time anymore, right? <laughs> it's very much not part-time anymore. <laughs> it actually only stayed part-time for a couple of months. It was supposed to be long-term part-time and then they, they found more work for me to do. So <laughs> that's so, that's so cool. I mean, not cool necessarily in the moment of the five days of lying on your side, <laughs> but just that, I mean, that's the beauty of, you know, watching Netflix <laughs> that you can do lying on your side for five days very easily. Yeah, yeah it turns out <laughs> you, you do it with your eyes closed, turns out. So right. it's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. So you really understand what the viewer is experiencing and how important that description is to the meaning of the programming, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think actually the first program I watched was Glow. Um, which it turns out Descriptive Video Works did the AD for. And I didn't know that at the time. I had no idea when I applied. That's, But when I first got hired by Descriptive Video Works, uh, our narrator, Diane, was narrating the last season of Glow. And I was like, I know that show and I know that voice. That voice, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Um, I want to... It hear sort of the process for creating because it, it is really quite involved and it actually starts i guess with convincing the people producing the content that it needs to be described in the first place like how involved is dvw with that part and then i do want you to talk through kind of like how do you make it how does this <laughs> come to be do you want to talk reese about the sales part before i talk about that <laughs> sure 
<laughs> so <laughs> my approach to sales is persistent kid brother t- tugging at their sleeve going, do you want to have this described? Do you want to have this described? No. Uh, um, in, in fairness, most of our clients are really forthcoming and, and are seeking out people to do the work. If they're, there doesn't take, it, it, there's not as much convincing to do it. There are some areas of convincing where it's like, convincing people to pay a reasonable amount for the work um but the but the actual activity is 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 fairly entrenched and embedded in some workflows i think um you know there the areas where i spend my time sort of advocating for increased audio description usually is outside of the sort of standard tv and film area which uh, you know so uh live broadcast uh i'm i'm working hard to try to make inroads and with uh, and break down some perceptual barriers as to why it can't work. Um, and, and then other forms of uh, video media that aren't traditionally audio described. I mean, think of all of the video content that's uploaded uh, thousands of hours every second, right? Uh, around the world in every shape or form on every information website uh, and uh, you know, you know some of the efforts on on that front, and then the other is is to uh, <laughs> explain to people that there aren't just audio description consumers who speak English. There are those who speak other languages, and so uh, perhaps a, a multi language approach is is uh, consistent with the the end goal of accessibility. So um, those are really the areas where I'm sort of like advocating. But generally speaking, our clients seek us out because they want to have the content described We're we're not like um tracking them down so much i, I as i said with the sort of corporate or non-standard film and tv uh, accounts it's a little bit different that's so good to hear because i feel like when it when it first came out when dvw when no sorry when described video was first a thing it was not a standard and it was something i think you had to convince people to produce so i'm really yeah. happy to hear that i think i think there's a couple of things that's happened right, right? there's legislation that uh, certainly um enacted some uh some inroads in that area and uh built some repetitive processes that made it easier for they didn't feel to our clients like it was a bespoke process each time that they could keep going back to a vendor or a set of vendors and get a consistent product and it became part of their supply chain. Um, the other part that really changed things, I think, was uh, the birth of streaming as a and subscription-based uh, entertainment access as a as a key component because you know in an ad-based model you don't necessarily get paid more because you're reaching a blind mm-hmm. audience. Whereas right. if you're producing a subscription service and you want to reach the maximum number of people, making your content accessible is sort of a sound business practice. And I think mm-hmm. we don't ever get shared any of that intel from our clients, but let's just say companies that we know are mining data to make decisions are making decisions to continue to expand their accessibility, which means they presumably are finding enough meaningful reasons to do so. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Melissa, tell us the details. How do we create this amazing <laughs> service? <laughs> the, the summary version is, is write, record, mix, deliver. Um, but of course, there you go, Sean. <laughs> that's all you need to know. It sounds um, like dance moves or something. Yeah, yeah. It's a box when stuff. it's going well, it's a good dance. When it's not going well, well, everybody's stepping on each other's toes. Um, the, the, the process is pretty simple. Like compared to say dubbing a movie, audio description is a fairly straightforward process with fewer people involved, uh, per project. And so in some ways it is. It is that simple, but of course there's complexity within that. Um, so writing is first. And once we, when we receive a video from a client, um, sometimes it'll be watermarked or black and white or preliminary. So there's sort of complications involved, but ideally we get a fairly final video that's fairly easy to watch and we send it to a writer. And our writers are specially trained and um, very, very focused on audio description. 
uh, because we're an audio description only company, it means that we don't tend to have as many people who are also doing translation and also doing closed captioning and things like that. So our, a lot of our writers, this is their whole job um, or a primary job. And they get very good, of course, at using very efficient language and writing a script where all the words, where the, all the phrases fit in the time allowed and they're not treading on dialogue and they are hitting all the most important points. And, you know, they'll never be able to describe as much as they want, but at least they're describing enough to make sure the story gets told. From there, the script will uh, go usually through a QC process at that point, um, make sure that, you know, the characters are named correctly, that uh, an important detail wasn't lost or confused, uh, that we've chosen good words and, and haven't confused the issue by using a word that has multiple meanings, things like that, and goes into the recording studio. One of our narrators will record it, uh, typically just one narrator per project, though if there's a lot of subtitles, we will use uh, multiple narrators to do the subtitles, uh, reading them. And that's done typically with, with one of our recordists. So we do have sort of supervised or, or guided recording sessions. But some of our narrators have been doing this for many, many years and could probably just <laughs> rattle it off on their own. Uh, but we find that, you know, you get the best quality and the best consistency with, with guided sessions whenever possible. Then from there, the recordings go to a mixer. And uh, again, our mixers are all... This, this is what they do, is full-time audio description mixing. And so they are really good at making sure that uh, they nudge lines off of dialogue, or nudge lines off of um, special uh, important sound effects and really work around the important sounds of the show as much as they can. And that they duck things smoothly so that there isn't abrupt changes in volume of the original show. And it doesn't sound like the audio description is invading the show, but is a natural part of the audio of the audio track. And uh, then it, sometimes it goes through another QC process, uh, though often the 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 uh, mixer is part of our QC team as well. So they'll be always watching every every step is always watching for potential errors, and then we deliver it to the client. Okay, so the writers cannot be like people who write books. Like you don't want somebody who's <laughs> <laughs> flowery <Yeah>. and <laughs> it's a different <laughs> skill set and mm -hmm. it's like people can do both of course because people can have multiple skills but we don't necessarily find that a novelist or especially a screenwriter as sometimes screenwriters have the hardest time converting to thinking in audio description because it is a different way of thinking about the world well, uh, and, and seeing things Mm -hmm. I, I think the biggest uh, challenge for a screenwriter is is a is when they're writing screenplays, they're omniscient, right? They are the thoughts of every character. When you're writing audio description, you actually have to be the opposite. You can you have to n not be omniscient of the character's intent. You are just describing what they're doing. You're obviously observing and you're 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 interpreting and and, and translating it, but you you can't. We, can, we can't make assumptions on what the creative intent was, mm -hmm. or we try really hard not to. It's funny because, I mean, I have watched stuff where not not anything DVW is produced, of course, but uh, <laughs> where there is interpretation, the describer is is like putting their own subjective interpretation on the facial expression in the way that they're describing it. I can't think of mm -hmm. an example, but, you know, he looks at her with he's think like it's sort of implying what the person's thinking or stating what the person's thinking based on the expression on their face. I'm like, mm, that's probably a little far fetched, you know, a little more than the, the, I don't know, than they should be giving. I don't know. Yeah. My, my pet peeve is he looks, he, he's thinking like, just, yeah. just let the silence say that, you know, you know, the two <laughs> characters were talking and now there's a silence. You don't have to say he's thinking. We, right. Yeah, there, we can tell. <laughs> there are other ways of conveying some of that information. Like he looks longingly. Does it, that? That's an interpretation. Mm -hmm. He lingers on her face is a description, right? right? Yes. And it can it allows, and and you know it's a it's a delicate art, right? Because there is there is the there's the, we're battling to be concise, and sometimes 
just telling you exactly what we think is happening would be the more concise option. But at the same time, we don't want to pander to the audience. We want to give the audience the opportunity to like make their own conclusions, draw their own conclusions, not just be told what the story is. And you're not seeing the script that the actor got where it says you should be angry in this moment or right like you don't sometimes we get those we but... sometimes get those yeah okay pretty rarely is that and even easier then... then to to do the writing if you know like then you don't like are you helping the actor if he's not as good at <laughs> conveying <laughs> what he's supposed to <laughs> I, I think i think where, where scripts can be really helpful is it, as melissa said sometimes we're working with less than optimal video quality when we're writing it and sometimes our writers are are straining their eyes to pick out exactly what it is that he's picking up with his right hand. And right. then the script could be a reference point to say, oh, he's picking up uh, a dumbbell or whatever it might be. And that that's where a script could be really, really helpful. But mm. I don't know, Melissa, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's that's the main use and making sure we have the characters' names correct so that if there's 10 people in a scene and you're having trouble telling who's saying what, it, the script really helps with that. Mm. But I think I think in some ways the writers try to avoid reading the script for intent because we're not supposed to be doing intent. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And I know like there are times you have to use a short short version. You, you just need to for time. So you know you can't say uh, you don't have time to say. Sometimes she crumples on the bed and tears run down her face. Sometimes you just have to say, she looks sad because that's all you, yeah. you've got time for three syllables. Yeah. Um, so we try to make sure we include things like she appears to be, she looks like she's we, like those, mm -hmm. those words are pretty important to us to try to clarify that that's an appearance, not us standing in her head telling you. Okay. I, let's talk about quality control because not all described video was created equally. And I can think of <laughs> one program I watched where they get one of the main characters names wrong all the time. Her name's Leah and they say Lee. And every time I yell at the TV, it's Leah. And it just like, it's so disruptive and it makes me so angry, but I love the show. So I'm going to keep watching it. But how do you, I guess, I feel like Descriptive Video Works has done some things to ensure high quality. What are those and, and why have you done that? I'll, I'll start and then most if you want to pick it up. So I think that, like uh, as we were sort of outlining in the sort of discussion of the, dis the production process, like it all starts with the writers and um, and without good audio description writing, even with a great narrator and great mixing, you're not going to have a good experience. And so uh, we feel like we've got the best AD writers in the business working for us. And I think um, we we work, the whole team works with them. And the whole, one of the advantages I think that Descriptive Video Works has in this area is that there isn't anyone working for us who is focused on anything other than audio description. Like, we are solely focused. There's no, we don't do audiobooks, we don't do captioning, we don't do dubbing, we don't do ADR, any of the other sound facility stuff. And so we we sort of swarm the work to make sure collectively we're all trying to aim for the highest quality or the highest possible quality of the experience. And so we if we bring in new writers, they are working with some of the experienced writers to make sure that the tips and tricks that those writers have picked up over the years. Because a lot of our, um, a lot of the core writing group for this, this company has been working to like for DVW for more than a decade, in some cases, close to two decades. And so, you know, there, you might have somebody who's really gifted uh, who's just joined us, but they won't necessarily have encountered every single possible type of program. And so, uh, that's where partnering someone who's new with somebody who's been more experienced is really, really valuable. And and the I will say full credit to everybody involved because people's egos get parked and everyone is striving. It, and honestly, I will say that in my years of working in this area, like in the industry, it's the least egocentric group of people 
because everybody is humble enough to recognize that it's not about them. And that's super cool. And so that, that seems to lead to that collaboration. But Melissa, we also have some specific processes and I'll, I'll let you get into those ones. Well, I mean, actual formal QC, having somebody read the script and um, and kind of engage with it is part of that process, especially we had a, a TV show recently. I don't think I can say what it is. Oh, it, it is out, so I can talk about it. Um, Halo, we did the audio description for Halo. And um, that's going to be a high profile project with a lot of big fans watching it very closely. And so we wanted to make sure that it was even more right <laughs> than usual. Um, you know, we have our normal processes and then we have our processes for the projects where it's going to be harder. It's a world, uh, science fiction is always harder than, you know, a Hallmark movie because there's a whole world being built. And this one had subtitles for alien languages and aliens that nobody's ever seen before. And, you know, so many factors that make it a highly complex project. So one of the things we did with that is we found ourselves a QC expert who also loved Halo and who is blind. And he watched the videos and worked with the writer to make sure that we got everything right from his perspective as well. And so he was familiar with the world already from playing the games. And he was willing to basically watch these shows without an audio description and talk to the writer about what needed to be covered and review the scripts to make sure that it was covered adequately. And so that's that was a bit of a, an extra step for that one because it was going to be so hard. But we have we, we do that. We do that when that's what it's called what is called for. Um, you know, when it's a straightforward romantic comedy, it's more of a somebody's just checking to make sure that uh, the spellings are correct and that the pronunciation guide is there because I know exactly how that Lelia happens. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> I can I can see the process by what that happens. That happens when the writer didn't put in a pronunciation guide, and it went to the narrator who isn't watching the whole show. The narrator is just watching the piece that they're describing over and the person's name is almost never going to be said then because there's no dialogue where we're talking and then the mixer is just jumping from piece to piece inserting the audio description without listening to the scenes around it and so nobody catches that it's mm. pronounced wrong so like yeah. I, I can see where it mm -hmm. goes wrong in my head and it's one of those things that it doesn't it doesn't go that wrong very often but you got to prevent those and so that's our whole process is about you know more people watching more of the show and look more eyes on the script more often to make sure that things like that don't slip through in, and in fair in fairness to and not i don't know the specific instance of this this particular show that you're talking about sean but like in fair in fairness to people involved in it the everything is sped up right now the demand for audio description is is skyrocketing the amount of time we have to do things is less and less the it's a it's a bit of a high wire act mm -hmm. um at dvw what we've sort of really been talking about really for the last year uh, as this has been going on is how do we increase our guardrails how do we ensure that w with this scaling up we aren't losing any of the quality i i that you know we can do that because it's really a core of what we're what's important to us not every company has that luxury or not every audio description department within a larger company has that luxury and so um i don't want to excuse it because it is less than optimal service but i can totally understand how it happens mm -hmm. Are you pitching to writers? Hey, we've got this program coming out. Like, I feel like if I was a writer, I'd be super excited to write for a show that I already watch mm -hmm. that, you know, I get to see it before <laughs> the viewer gets to see it. Like that's quite a privilege or, you know, for Halo, somebody who actually is familiar with Halo so that they're going to be able to describe those aliens maybe because they're familiar with them. Is that part of like deciding who does what? Yeah, absolutely. So not with every project, you know, with a, you know, corporate 
video where we have a short turnaround and anybody can do it, then anybody will do it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, these special projects, like you said, established franchises, uh, high profile um, things, we are seeking those people out. So it's sometimes I'm sending out emails to all my writers going, so who's watched this before or who knows anything Mm -hmm. about this? Um, We also get all our writers when they join us uh, to fill out a survey that tells us all their special skills and things. So if we get a movie about race cars, we can look up and see who has some interest in race cars or, you know, whatever skateboarding, um, Mm -hmm. you know, who, who knows something about skateboarding uh, so that they can describe the tricks better and stuff like that. So yeah, it, it's uh, definitely a balancing act because like Reese says, sometimes those timelines are tight and I don't get to use the writer I want, but a lot of the time, a lot of the time we can make that work. That's cool. I, yeah, we, I think we, we, <laughs> we know who wants to write a cooking show. We know who wants to write content about sports and we know that putting uh, a cooking show with somebody who wants to write sports or vice versa is probably the uh, poor idea, but I, I will say one of the things that's really extraordinary about the writing group team at DVW, and it's quite a large team now, is their ability to juggle so many different genres so successfully. You know, if you were to look through the list of credits of the writers and go, wait a second, the same person wrote that and wrote that? Like, those are completely different. Um, and uh, um, I don't... I. I I'm, I'm allowed to, to talk about this, so I, I'm going to use a circling back to your question, Sean, about like writers pitching us on things they want to work on. We, we've been working for the last year on uh, some content for Showtime that's going to be coming out. And it's a lot of sort of like shows that people have watched over the many years of Showtime's existence. We definitely had writers come out of the word word work going, I love this show. Please let me write this one. And, um, and so when we get an opportunity to work on content like that, it's, it's very cool. Yeah. Well, fun for everybody. I feel like that's great. Yeah. And we also do, the writers tease me sometimes because they all have a list of things they prefer not to work on. And every once in a while, one of them ends up working on those things. And uh, one of our long-term writers was telling me um, that she actually found out she doesn't mind horror so much when she's writing it for audio description because she sees the wave forms so she sees the audio waveforms and she she knows where the jump scares are going to be right because that's where the waveform suddenly hops up and she says it's it's not so bad writing horror when you know when the horrible thing is actually going to happen you can brace yourself <laughs> and she was a really good sport about that i didn't realize she didn't like horror at that time <laughs> yeah so in addition to like choosing the right writer you also need to choose the right narrator the voice to go behind that and I guess that's a I guess that would be less as exciting for the person doing the narration they're not actually necessarily watching the whole program they're just Sometimes. recording or do they get to see it I I mean it probably depends yeah I think it plays in the background for all of them but um depending on how much description there is they might just be jumping from description to description Mm. so if it's like one of those action-packed shows where there's a whole bunch of scenes where there's virtually no description like a really talky show I guess more than action-packed then there might they might jump entire scenes um before they describe again so they don't get to really be with the program very much (laughs) right but the but I mean the the subject of like how narrators get matched to shows is, is actually a th- I think a really interesting topic. I was I was speaking to uh, a class yesterday uh, about that. So Melissa, do you want to sort of walk through the standard approach to casting? Yeah. So the the first consideration is always making sure that the person isn't going to sound like any of the other characters. Mm. and that they are not going to sound out of place either. So the uh, two ways we try and do that is is gender contrast and age matching. So we try and make sure that the person sounds like they are the same age as the kind of average character in the show. You know, if you were doing Friends, you would be aiming for somebody in their, I guess, their 20s. Um, but at the same time, doesn't is the opposite gender of the majority of the characters, which makes 
friend's a terrible example. Like right. <laughs> half. Um, got myself, backed myself into a corner with that. So, okay, Gunther pushes it probably more to the male. <laughs> voice, so. There you Definitely. go. There you go. That's, yeah. the, that's the lean there. Um, so what that ends up meaning is that for shows like Breaking Bad, we use a female narrator. But at the mm. same time, you don't want somebody to sound super feminine because a, a high-pitched, gentle kindergarten teacher sounding voice would just sound terrible in that show. So you want to match the feel of the show as well. It's one of the reasons we adore Diane so much is she's our narrator for This is Breaking Diane Bad. Newman, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's our narrator for Breaking Bad. And she has this wonderful smoky voice that just goes really well with drama, but at the same time, because a lot of those gritty dramas are male heavy, she doesn't blend in because mm. she's female. And so we love that. We love our, our young sounding male and female narrators who, who can go with a you know little kid show. Um, we, when you're casting for a preschool show, you kind of have two choices. You can have a narrator who sounds like a child themselves, or you can have a narrator who sounds like a preschool teacher, mm -hmm. sort of the warm, nurturing voice. So we love finding those those people out uh, in the world. And so, yeah, it's about a, sort of a balancing act between sounds like the show, but doesn't blend into anybody in the show. So it doesn't cause confusion. Wow. So many things to consider. Um, let's talk about you have hired some blind narrators and I am so curious how that idea came about and how the heck they do the, the job. Like, you know, the, it's just the irony of it is really blowing my mind that this is a service that's created for people who are blind. And yet somebody who is blind is being the describer. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. just so cool. How did that come to be? So I, I think um, it was probably uh, just around two years ago that Melissa and I had a, a, a sort of a meeting with each other where we're just looking at like, are there things that we could do better as a company to sort of walk the walk of the talk that we talk? And um, there are a handful of areas that we looked at, you know, it, it, the one led to a focus group around race and audio description, but another was the, the, um, you know, the, the message of uh, uh, nothing about us without us and uh, how we could take some steps to, to incorporate that into our workflow uh, more appropriately. Um, and um, we were also, uh, you know, we have a, a friendly arms race in this area with a, another audio description company who have uh, undertaken similar initiatives. Uh, and I, there's no harm in me saying that it's uh, International Digital Center. Um, they've really been um, also at the forefront of this. And so um, they, they uh, so we really have been looking to find uh, blind and low vision voice talent. And some of that is our pre-existing voice talent that's out there that we, we've, uh, uh, retained for the services. And then in other cases, it's, um, it's like searching for and, and doing demos with people who, whose voices we think could be a good match and who may have the ability to sort of learn the skill with time. And, and, uh, so it's been a, a mixture of both. Um, and, uh, it's definitely something where we've learned a lot and I think we've continued to, like it, it's not a complete process. We've we've got fairly aggressive sort of in, inclusivity goals as a company, and so um, it's it, it's an area we want to continue to dig into and continue to mine. It's an ongoing, active conversation within our group um, about uh, and and it, and as I mentioned, the the other company that we're in this friendly arms race with, we we share information about what we're doing, um, whether it be in the areas of QC or whether it be in the areas of of narration or advisory council work, um, consultation stuff that we're doing and that they're doing. Because at the end of the day, there's nothing. I mean, I think it's actually to our benefit as a company. Um, competitively to be doing this because I think it raises our level of service. But I, 
uh, but I don't think that there's anything proprietary about it. I think it's something we should, it's, it's something we want to model as a company because we think it's something that should be pervasive in the industry. But Melissa, I'll let you talk about the actual sort of the nuts and bolts of how it works. Yeah, so currently we uh, don't actually have any local narrators uh, who are blind working with us, though we think that's going to change in the fall. We've got some some contacts out there. Um, but uh, so all our current narrators are remote and are so they're recording from home studios. So we're lucky enough, of course, that if they already had home studios set up a lot of the time, they're very good with microphones and things like that already, uh, which is I mean, it's a skill set, right, to know how far away from your mic to be and how to make sure everything comes through uh, clear and uh, uh, records well. So they are people who are podcasters, uh, voices, like voice actors in other areas. And I don't think we have anybody radio, but uh, I think it's mostly podcasters and, and uh, voice actors. And there's two different ways that they, or there's probably three different ways they're absorbing the scripts. Um, the, some of them are doing sort of a talk back thing. So they will be listening to the script read by, a, you know, text to speech engine and then speaking it, um, which it sounds, sounds really challenging to me, but the people who are good at it are very good at it. Uh, some of them use Braille and some of them, especially the people who are uh, low vision will use, you know, magnifiers and large text and sort of half memorize the script to help with that. Um, the advantage audio description has uh, is that the lines tend to be short versus say an audio book where pages and pages. So refreshable braille, uh, text to speech and magnified text are all a little easier since the lines tend to be shorter and each line is sort of recorded separately anyway. So you don't have to worry about the flow between lines like you would if you were doing a full monologue of some kind. What about the timing? Is that is there sort of like hints in the script where it says you have to say this in five seconds or two seconds, or is that something that the mixer can speed up or slow down later? The mixer can a little bit, but it does usually sound artificial then. So we mm -hmm. try to only do that if absolutely necessary, no matter who's narrating every once in a while, you do have to speed up a line sort of artificially, but for the most part, we get to avoid that. So yeah, there's um, two kinds of audio description we do. Most of our audio description is what you would call in line, which is where the, the, the timing is sensitive. You do have to fit it right in that space. And so um, the scripts do come with time in and time out codes, uh, so they know how long they have. And uh, so some of the time, people are just some people are just really good at that. They they're very good at the timing, and some people who maybe haven't developed that skill yet uh, get one of our recordists to remote in, and they will say, "Okay, this is you know this is how long you'll have. Start, stop, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, you have to do that one a little bit faster." Oh, you don't have to rush that quite that much, that kind of thing. Mm. So the, yeah, the remote recordists can definitely help with that. The other kind of audio description we do is extended where we pause the video to fit more description in. And uh, so we do that uh, mostly for corporate sort of YouTube type videos. And we love those because then the person can just record however long the line takes and then we make the video long enough to fit the line. Um, so that's a little bit of a dream situation and we only get to do it with really short videos, but it does make it really easy for the narrators. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, that, I think there's a future in that for other things. I think, I think the, the lines are going to blur between linear media and interactive media and we'll, we'll end up with an opportunity to do something a little bit more dynamic. I, I was also just wanting to interject that one of the things that's been really exciting ab about doing this is is that um, for Melissa and I and, and the rest of the DVW group, like uh, lived experience for narrators is really, I think, important to us and the diversity of voices. And, um, you know, not every piece of content is something that people will connect to. As Melissa said, there are the occasional corporate video that's just what it is. And it's not necessarily something that anyone will benefit from a greater emotional connection to. But a lot of the content that's, you know, that's not true. and and. Um, whether it be working with 
narrators um, of color or whether it be working with narrators of, uh, of different gender identity or whether it be working with blind narrators, that sort of the experience of hearing a human voice who has a lived experience that is coming through in that uh, narration is, I think, vital to the the quality of audio description. And it's, you know, I mean, synthetic voice has a, a probably a role within the greater audio description world, but I don't think anything can touch that lived experience, especially if you if you take it seriously, you do it with intent and you get the right people in the booth, I think it really can enhance the, the product immensely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really cool. I love that you're doing that. Um, let's talk about the advisory council. So this is another way you've brought individuals who are blind or low vision in to the process. Yeah. So, I mean, you're partly to blame for that, Sean. Um, <laughs> That's cool. I, so... <laughs> Uh, early on, I had the opportunity to do to do a, a virtual because everything was virtual at the time. Uh, talk uh, and you were part of that, and listening to what you had to say, I like I learned a lot from that, mm. and um, and talking to you over the course of time, uh, on and off. And I know Diane had uh, Diane Johnson, our founder, had uh, run focus groups and and advisory council sessions. Um, sort of on an ad hoc basis over the years um, on specific topics. And, uh, but the more I spoke to members of the blind and low vision community uh, in various specific areas, the more I realized that uh, it was vital for the strategic interest of our company to be mining how much insight everyone has about these specific areas in which they're passionate. I, I remember, I think I said this to people when I, I sort of brought around the idea of the sort of recurring advisory councils, because I have only the limits of my imagination as to what this could be. And I'm not that imaginative. I really need help. And so if we, if we want to live the credo that we have at DVW, which is describe everything, well, what is that everything? What is the most meaningful part of that onion to start peeling now versus, you know, five years from now? And, um, and so... Uh, and, and there were lots of really other, there were lots of people that we were having active conversations in other areas with, um, whether it be people who partaken in our focus group around race and audio description, or whether it was someone like Brandon Cole, who's an expert in uh, blind accessible gaming, video gaming. And we were looking at what audio description and gaming looked like. And, and I was like, literally, I was on the verge of giving up on it as a thing for us to do when I spoke to Brandon and he, and he, he pointed me in a direction that, that I hadn't really been looking. And I was like, Oh man, this is incredibly like insightful and valuable. And why, why, why wouldn't we do this on a recurring basis? So it, it so the advisory council is um, made up of uh, eight people currently. And there, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll see whether there's a, there's room or interest in expanding from that. Um, and it's a it's a quarterly conversation about certain trends or things that are happening in in audio description. It's an opportunity for me to throw out questions, whether they be benign or controversial, and and get a, a sanity check on things, get insight. But it's also been in between those sort of really great conversations. We had one a few weeks ago, which I which was the highlight of my month. Um, w w in between those, there's it's. I've learned that you know certain people that I knew were interested in certain aspects of audio description are also really big hockey fans. And so when we were doing live AD for the Olympics for CBC, I connected the describer who was doing the hockey broadcasts with members of our advisory council because they had a passion for the sport. And and um, and you know there's other areas we we've continued to mine. You know that. The, and so deeper relationships, deeper, deeper connections are being built professionally, as as well as just like the amount of learning and insight we can gain um, from the, that process. So it, like, it's really the, the the coolest, I think it's the coolest thing we're doing, because uh, it's the part that I just get to sit back and go, I had never thought of it like that. That's amazing. And I was saying to somebody last week, that my 
<laughs> this is going to sound, um, maybe this might come out wrong, but m much of my career in film post-production, I was brought in to be like the, the expert on a specific, like really small subject of like, how do you get film to Germany from London or whatever it might be? Like, how do you move things around? How do you cr crunch data in a meaningful way? And, um, and so I developed this sort of like, oh, like Reese is going to come out and be the expert in this. In, in this area, I, all I do is like try to listen and, and learn. And it's so refreshing to spend my time being educated. And uh, so it's, that's, I mean, so really what I'm saying, Sean, in the end is the advisory council is completely self-serving. I like it. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I will also say that the launch of the advisory council is also like, pretty consistent with like some ma massive growth in our company. And I mean, I think that's also like, I don't know whether that's cosmically or actually just commercially, like that is, I think there's an alignment there. Mm -hmm. Well, as a member of the advisory council, it's, it's so nice to want to be heard <laughs> about things like, you know, like, I feel like there's this openness to hear about something that's frustrating that's happening mm -hmm. in the described video world or, or just to get questions answered. Like I, I learn through this process as well, even though I'm supposed to be there as some sort of expert. <laughs> so it, it's fantastic. Well, no, we, we want it to be reciprocal. It's a, everything is sort of a conversation and really building. And so, mm -hmm. um, and, and there isn't really, to tie it into the name of the podcast, there isn't really a limit to what we can do. See how what I did there? Um, <laughs> that was done. not that was not pre-planned, by the way. There is no there. There really shouldn't be a limit on what we can do. What we will do is another question entirely, and hopefully, we'll do a lot of it. And when I say that DVW wants to describe everything, I want to be clear. DVW, there's physics involved, and DVW does not have <laughs> the time and space to describe everything but we want everything to be described. And so whether it's us or whether it's other companies that are, that are following a similar path and deeply engaged in the process and really caring about the outcome of it, um, whether, you know, collectively, I think we can get to a point where everything can be described and, and the barrier of inclusion can come down. Yes. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you both being here. I feel like I, I could talk to you all day about this. It's so interesting to me. And we are going to have a part two and talk with Brandon Cole about Sweet. sort of being an, a blind narrator and his experience as well. That'll be coming up hopefully the week after this episode. Um, but if somebody wants to get involved with Descriptive Video Works as a writer, as a narrator, as an advisory council member, how can they learn more and, and where, where can they go? What can they do? Sure. So, so the, the email address is info at descriptivevideoworks.com. Uh, and I won't spell that out because I get it wrong. Uh, but info at descriptivevideoworks.com. Or you can go to the website, descript descriptivevideoworks.com and, and there's a contact us form there. Uh, otherwise, uh, Twitter is uh, a pretty good place to get a hold of us. Um, the company's uh, Twitter handle is at described video and uh, I'm at R-A-Z Lloyd, at Raz Lloyd, if you want to uh, just uh, chirp at me. Um, but, uh, and, uh, but yeah, those are the best ways to get a hold of us. We also have, if, if you're a writer of audio description, we got a job posting pretty consistently because we keep needing to hire more writers. So uh, you can look for that on your local job site. Awesome. Thank you both so much for being here today. This was so great. Thank you, Sean. It was great. Our pleasure. You've been listening to Limitless, the Blind Beginnings podcast. If you have a question, a comment, a future topic request, please send us an email to limitless at blindbeginnings.ca. Please share our podcast with a friend, like, subscribe, leave us a rating, and join us next time. This podcast has been brought to you by Blind Beginnings, an organization based in Vancouver, Canada, that supports children and youth who are blind or partially sighted, along with their families. Music for this podcast is composed by Sean Bishop and Clement Chow. Production and audio editing by Rob Minot. 
For more information about Blind Beginnings and the work it does to support children and youth who are blind and partially sighted, along with their families, visit us on the web at www.blindbeginnings.ca. And also remember to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time.